بروکسل، پارلمان اروپا کنفرانس در آستانه روز جهانی حقوق بشر با حضور مریم رجوی سخنرانی های نمایندگان پارلمان اروپا از کشورها و گروه های مختلف سیاسی و پارلمانی محکومیت موج اعدام ها و نقص حقوق بشر در ایران و مداخلات تروریستی فاشیسم مذهبی در منطقه I would like to welcome Madam Rajavi to the European Parliament. You have been in this Parliament uh, many times, and we know that half of my colleagues from different countries, different states, different pol political groups, different tendencies uh, support you uh, very strongly and your movement. I have had the honor, honor to be a friend <coughs> of the Iranian resistance for the last 13 years. And very frankly speaking, I'm not a diplomat. Uh, this Friends of Free Iran group is like my second family. Your presence here today also reminds me of your sisters and brothers in the Iranian resistance in Albania. I have gone to see them several times. We'd like to call them as Ashrafis, because Camp Ashraf was the symbol of resistance for millions of Iranians. We, the European Parliament, have been very much concerned for their safety and security when they were in camps Ashraf and Liberty in Iraq. We are happy that they are now safe and secure in Albania. But we know that the Iranian regime is very angry and upset, but this shows that this opposition is really feared by the Iranian regime, which spends a lot of energy and millions of euros against the democratic opposition under the, your leadership, uh, Madam Rajavi. Now, that Madam Rajavi is again the European Parliament, I know that regime will go, will go, will go crazy. As long as executions continue in Iran, as long as freedom of speech is repressed in Iran, as long as religious minorities, including Christians and Sunni Muslims, are repressed in Iran, we cannot and we must not have a normal relations with this regime. It has always said that in our relations with Iran, Europe must put human rights first. We must not compromise on this. We are very critical of the attitude of uh, Madame Mogherini, who has kept silence on human rights violations and has a very friendly relations with the government of uh, Mr. Rouhani. We should remind her that under Rouhani, Iran has had the highest number of executions in the world per capita. So, to conclude, finally speaking, I should insist the Iranian regime is not only the enemy of the people of Iran, but it's also our enemy. It's the enemy of all the democratic values we enjoy. If we really want to see a peaceful, really peaceful and stable Middle East, we need a regime change in Iran. And that is the reason we should actively support you, Madam Rajavi, and uh, your movement for free Iran. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Chair. Madame Rajavi, colleagues, friends, uh, it is my great pleasure and honor to be here once more during this, this uh, excellent meeting to, to, to uh, put high the banner of, of human rights and, and democracy and fight for freedom. And actually, when I look uh, into the, the, the plethora of all things, of, of issues that we have to discuss uh, in this context, uh, the situation of Iranian people, uh, 
the, the excellent leading role of Madame Rajavi and her opposition, Iranian uh, movement, resistance movement, uh, led by her, is a real example that gives us, all of us, to all of us, hope uh, and, and uh, prospects for, for, for better future in, in this respect. Well, on a, I must admit that from the very beginning, I, I was uh, rather skeptical about Western endeavors to, to strike a nuclear deal with Iran. Um, once it is uh, uh, in, in force, I think it is extremely difficult to, to, to uh, somehow discuss the future of deal itself. But what I would like to raise now is uh, the example of behaviors, both good ones, and here I mean, first of all, your attitude and, and the leadership of Madame Rajavi. <coughs> Uh, because it was thanks to you that we are able to, to show the holistic picture of the role of uh, Iran led by Rouhani regime. Uh, unfortunately, portrayed by us, the Western world, as so-called moderate <coughs> regime. And why so? Because there are calculations behind this. And unfortunately, what I'm ca I can see for for time being on our side, it is using language that is contrary to, to, to what we should do while we promote our West Western values. Why do we avoid straight war, forward yeah. words about human in rights in Iran yeah. in our annual yeah. human yeah. rights reports? Yeah. Why do we focus yeah. on some areas yeah. just yeah. putting yeah. aside yeah. the role of, of a regime, role of, of uh, um, a revolutionary guard and some other issues? Uh, we are, we are able to, to arrange urgencies and debates about one uh, capital punishment execution in the world. And then, what, 18 ones in the same week. And, and we are silent. And no requests for urgencies on this. We have to return to a single set of values, try to avoid hypocrisy, not to, to focus on, on, let's say, some, some things that are proxy topics. And here, I really pay tribute to Marian Rajavi for, for uh, assisting, helping families of, of victims. It's the best way of behavior because it is, it is very difficult, it is very complicated, it is usually very dangerous. And she is really a brave woman, I think. <laughs> I dream about a time when we are able to, to myself or my colleagues sitting in chairs in plenary chamber and listening to her addressing us in the capacity of president of Iran. Thank you. <laughs> I'm really happy to be with you today to mark the eve of International Human Rights Day. And it is really encouraging to see so many of the Friends of Free Iran gathered here today. 
You know, it is now some four years since Hassan Rouhani came to power as the so-called moderate president. And since we have witnessed a constant deterioration of human rights and a shocking rise in the number of executions ever since. Do you know, according to Amnesty International, Iran alone accounted for 55% over half of all recorded executions in the world in 2016. Rouhani's regime has executed more than 80 women and many more women are in prison because they dared to express their opinions. According to the United Nations, the executions under Rouhani in Iran last year were the highest in 25 years. This means even by the regime's own admission, this is the worst wave of executions since the mass executions of 30,000 political prisoners in Iran in 1988. But the EU seems to have forgotten about, or worse, just ignored these atrocities. Instead of continued cooperation, the EU should be severing all diplomatic and trade relations with Iran until executions end and human rights are respected. Frederica Mogherini, the EU's high representative, even went to Tehran to celebrate Rouhani's inauguration for his second term. That was in August this year. She was accompanied by Zimbabwe's now ousted dictator, Robert Mugabe, and North Korea's number two, Kim Jong-nam. Not good company. And frankly, very embarrassing for us in Europe to be represented in that way. The European Parliament's delegation for relations with Iran visited Iran last week. The delegation's own statement, published on the European Parliament's website after the visit, failed to mention that during the same week that they were in Tehran, the regime had executed 18 people. And this is truly regrettable. We are elected people of Europe. We are elected by the people. And we must represent their values, and which are freedom of speech, women's rights, human rights, and the value of democracy. It is really damaging for us in Europe and the European Parliament to be identified with brutal regimes such as Iran. Now, on the other hand, I'm very pleased to see the Iranian democratic opposition under the leadership of Maryam Rajavi making so much progress, despite all the repression at home and despite the EU's appeasement policy towards Iran, Maryam Rajavi's campaign to seek justice for the families of the victims of the 1988 massacre has been taken up by the UN Special Rapporteur for Human Rights in Iran, who has called for an independent investigation into that massacre. And Mrs. Rajavi's campaign to blacklist the Islamic Revolutionary Guards has led to new sanctions being imposed on the Revolutionary Guards by the United States Treasury. This was a real body blow to this repressive regime. So we must really thank her and the Iranian democratic opposition she leads for standing up against Islamic fundamentalism and for setting an example for us and for the rest of the world to follow. At a time when Islamic fundamentalism is really the greatest enemy we face in the world, Maryam Rajavi is providing enormous hope. I believe that the question of defeating this enemy begins with gender equality, it begins with women's rights, which I want to see accepted as part of Iranian society. 
And if we could see a democratically elected Maryam Rajavi in charge of Iran, we could see Islamic fundamentalism defeated. Thank you. Madam, Madam Rajavi, let me just conclude by saying, Mariam, you are an inspiration to us all. Mariam Rajavi is a very brave lady. She is a great leader. Long live free Iran. Thank you well, uh, Mr. Dupre, uh, also for organizing this meeting. Um, and, and I'm so happy that we have uh, the leader of the Iranian Democratic Opposition, Mrs. Uh, Mariam Rajavi, with here us uh, uh, today. Um, look around you and you will see your movement has a lot of sympathy in the European Parliament as a democratic platform for a secular and for a free uh, Iran. And I've, like the rest of my colleagues, been following the situation uh, in Iran. And I'm really glad that we have this intergroup, this uh, uh, free Iran intergroup here in the European Parliament and I really am I'm, I'm convinced that it's important that we have such a, uh, a strong and diverse group where members of all different political tendencies speak with one voice when it comes to the human rights situation uh, and the need to support democratic alternative to this regime in Iran. With, this, uh, with the experience of nearly four decades that this regime is in power now, everyone agrees, when you look at the facts, that this is a cruel uh, regime uh, that not only represses its own citizens, especially the women, as we've heard, and younger uh, generation who seek more freedoms, but it's also a troublemaker and a threat to the region and the rest of the world. We can look to their interventions in neighboring Iraq and Syria, uh, where they support the systematic repression of the Sunnis by these regimes, uh, which led to the rise of ISIS. We've also seen their secret nuclear ambitions that was revealed by the uh, uh, democratic opposition in 2002, which led to the comprehensive sanctions and to the nuclear deal, which still has some loopholes uh, as there are no uh, inspections allowed to the military uh, sites where the regime might pursue its secret activities. We have seen after the first term of the so-called moderate uh, Hassan Rouhani in office that the situation of human rights has deteriorated, that the number of executions has multiplied even compared to the pre predecessor, uh, uh, Ahmadinejad. Rouhani's new cabinet even includes ministers who are on the EU's um, uh, sanction list, sanction list for gross human rights violations. So it is very disappointing for me to see the EU high representative, uh, Ms. Mogherini, to be so obsessed, obsessed and so keen to have a warm and very friendly relations with this regime, closing her eyes for uh, the human rights violations and just encouraging companies to invest uh, in Iran. Uh, it is very destructive for the freedom movement uh, in Iran and very bad, very bad for the credibility of the European Union. The people of Iran expect European politicians to represent and defend European values such as democracy, freedom of speech. Our job is not in the first place to lobby uh, for Western companies, not at all. Unlike other nations in the region where there was no viable alternative after despotic rulers fell, which then led to chaos and internal war and conflicts. In the case of Iran, we have a very well organized and competent democratic alternative, which is ready to take over. The coalition of the National Council of Resistance of Iran under the leadership of uh, Ms. Uh, Mariam Rajavi that has been leading uh, th this struggle for several decades. And we've seen the support for uh, uh, Mrs. Rajavi when um, 100,000 supporters gathered in Paris last summer calling for a democratic change in Iran. Her 10-point uh, program for the future of Iran, where religion is separated uh, from the state, where men are equal to women, and where death penalty would be abolished. It is a, a, a plan that truly deserves the active support of the European governments and all 
EU officials. And there's no doubt in my mind that this despotic regime will fall sooner or later. It will go. It will disappear, like all others in history have, dis have gone. So our task must be to help make sure that the change happens sooner so that instead of dealing with this old despotic regime, we can invest in a truly free and in a truly democratic Iran. Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy, I'm happy we have Madame Rajavi here, who has bravely been leading the resistance against the theocratic regime for many years. I would like to speak about another aspect of Iranian regime's destructive policies, and that is their financing, financing of terrorism through money laundering via some European banks that has been going on under the radar. One of the most shocking examples was revealed in Slovenia, my home country. It involves Nova Ljubljanska Banka, NLB, the biggest Slovenian state-owned bank. Between 2008 and 2010, the NLB laundered a billion euros for the Iranian regime. The money was mainly coming from the Export Development Bank of Iran, which was a proxy of the Iranian State Bank. bank. At the time, the Iranian bank was blacklisted as it was subject embargo on the international market. The money was laundered by transferring smaller sums to more than 30,000 selected accounts in different countries around the world, including the United States of America, European Union, Canada, Russia, etc. According to the, uh, uh, to the findings of uh, competent international institutions, this scandal is a direct threat to global security. Slovenian authorities have done nothing to prevent or to prosecute those responsible, but the European Union is slowly becoming aware of the magnitude of this scandal. There was also hearing about this last week in the European Parliament's PANA Committee. We need to work together to block the Iranian regime's money laundering efforts on a global level. I am happy that the United States of America Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guards, who control the dirty money in Iran, on the sanctions list. We should do the same in Europe. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Chair. Thank you all to be here. We are all united in our support for human rights and for the democracy in Iran. And, uh, there's a lot of support and sympathy in the European Parliament for the democratic alternative under the leadership of Mrs. Rajavi. Today I want to briefly speak about one topic which hits Iran's Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps, the IRGC. The Islamic, the, sorry, the Iranian theocracy and its supreme leader. This is the force that is tasked with repressing the people inside Iran and uh, has also committed uh, despicable crimes in many countries of the region. The Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps has many centers in Iran where they train foreign terrorists. In many countries of the re region, the ERGC has effectively taken control of the foreign policy through the <coughs> Iranian embassies, where they also exploit diplomatic immunity. The IRGC uh, is also the most significant economic powerhouse in Iran. One must imagine. It has dedicated its financial and economical skills to meddling in other countries. And this meddling has been a very heavy burden on the Iranian economy. 
Over the past five years only, Tehran has spent over $100 billion for IRGC's operations in Syria alone. The money is spent on obtaining weapons and paying for the Syrian army's expenses. The United States recently backlisted the Iranian, the uh, Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. <coughs> this was a very good news for the people of Iran who really hate and despise this Revolutionary Guards. Since the Revolutionary Guards is now designated as a specially designated global terrorist organization by the US Treasury, the European companies trading with Iran will seriously risk of being sanctioned by the United States as the IRGC runs most of Iran's economy. Very clear. Trade with Iran today is essential trade with the IRGC. In Europe, because of the enormous trade interests of some big countries and EU's close relations with Tehran, the European governments have chosen not to annoy the mullahs and practically have closed their eyes to human rights violations. This is morally wrong and strategically harmful and dangerous for Europe. The EU must put the Islamic Revolutionary Guard on its terrorist lists. Thank you. We're all familiar with the extent of repression and abuse that takes place in Iran. From its very foundation, the regime in Tehran was based on the dual pillars of internal subjugation and the export of terrorism and reactionary religious beliefs. The policy of exporting Islamic fundamentalism and extremism has been a cornerstone of state strategy contained within the Iranian regime's constitution for the past 38 years. As we've heard earlier this year, Amnesty International published a 94-page report entitled Caught in a Web of Repression, Iran's Human Rights Defenders Under Attack. It detailed the appalling abuse of human rights in Iran and highlighted the Islamic Republic's notorious overuse of the death penalty. Iran, as we've heard repeatedly today, has long maintained world-leading rates of execution. Many of the hangings take place in public. Now, this is the real Iran under the theocratic and fascist rule of the mullahs, whose so-called moderate President Rouhani, the West believes it can do deals with. Rouhani is in charge of a venally corrupt government, which has executed around 3,500 people since he took office in 2013, 350 already this year. We have to understand the true nature of the so-called justice system in Iran, where the current justice minister, Ali Reza Abaye, has been listed on EU and UK terrorist lists since 2011 for human rights violations. He's the justice minister. The Iranian regime is the godfather of terror, spreading conflict and the systematic violation of human rights across the Middle East. The Islamic Revolutionary Guards Corps, the IRGC, as we've just heard very eloquently, uh, and the body responsible for extraterritorial operations, the terrorist Quds Force, under the ruthless leadership of General Qasem Soleimani, are the main vehicles for Iran's aggressive expansionism in the Middle East. The IRGC has for decades been carrying out terrorist attacks across the zone, including in Syria, Iraq, Yemen, and Lebanon. 
The fact that Iran has consistently supported and nurtured proxy extremist Shiite groups is not a matter of dispute. What are less clear are Tehran's relations with Sunni extremists. We've been lulled into believing that the disputes between the Shiites and the Sunnis are so significant that Iran could never countenance any sort of link with its Sunni rivals. Indeed, the regime has even occasionally posed as a de facto ally of the West in confronting Sunni extremists. But documents seized by the Americans during their raid on the residence of Osama bin Laden in Abbottabad on the 2nd of May 2011 have just been released and they've proved what many of us have known for many years. The Mullah's regime, as the epicenter of Islamic fundamentalism, has always been prepared to overlook sectarian differences with Sunni extremists to further the spread of fundamentalist terror worldwide. The European Iraqi Freedom Association, which I chair, has just published a 25-page report which details the extensive links between the Iranian regime and Sunni extremist groups like Al-Qaeda and Daesh. They're split into a thousand factions like the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, Daesh, Boko Haram, Hezbollah, and the other terrorist groups, and they all fight like cats in a sack, but they all look to Tehran as the godfather of fundamentalist Iran, uh, Islam. So the collapse of the Mullah's regime will bring an end to the spread of Islamist terror across the globe. But we must, Mr. Chairman, be on our guard. The Iranian regime is dangerous. I know from my own experience how they use propaganda to demonize their enemies, manipulating naive and vulnerable individuals to infiltrate their poisonous message, even here in this parliament. These programs of demonization are always a prelude to violent attacks. So I ask you to beware and be vigilant. And for those of us who hold human rights dear, we have to support the Iranian resistance under the inspired leadership of Mrs. Maryam Rajavi and the only legitimate democratic opposition movement, the PMOI, NCRI, to liberate the beleaguered Iranian people who ache and pray for the removal of this corrupt and evil regime and the restoration of human rights, women's rights, freedom, justice, and democracy to their long-suffering nation. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to start my short intervention uh, by saying that the delegation from the, this parliament who visited the last year and last month did not represent me, nor I believe a vast majority of, our, of, our, of my colleagues. That's the first point. And I have to say that if all the EU institutions and their representatives should keep human rights uh, high on their agendas, uh, it appears that this European delegation failed to point out that internal repression in Iran is unlikely to decrease. Economically, it is a fact that Iran presents a tempting uh, opportunity for the EU. Numbers showed last, that last year, following uh, the joint comprehensive plan of actions entering into force, EU-Iran trade nearly doubled compared to 2015. But Europe's approach to this renewing ties with Iran should not avoid a confrontation with Iranian authorities in areas like the arms embargo on Syria, violations of UN, United Nations Security Council resolutions, nuclear missile collaboration with North Korea, and human rights and fundamental rights uh, freedoms. Since 2013, some Western nations have put forward Iranian President Hassan Rouhani as a new face for moderation. But this supposedly moderate president has overseen more than 3,500 uh, executions in four years, just in four years, as well as ongoing crackdown on activism, independent press, and any social activities. 
Today, executions and human punishments remain a gloomy part of the everyday life of the Iranian people. And I'm sad to say that during the visit of the EPIS delegation last month to Iran, the Iranian authorities gifted our, uh, my colleagues, MEPs, with the execution of yet another 18 persons. That's inadmissible. The so-called moderate President Rouhani condones uh, torture and arbitrary imprisonment, extensively violates human, economic and social rights, and encourages brutal forms of punishment such as public floggings, amputations, and denial of medical treatment as a means of terrorizing its own population into docile submission. Although Iran signed the Convention on the, Human, on the Rights of the Children, uh, which places an absolute prohibition on the death penalty for offenses committed by persons under 18, the regime is still the leading execution of minors in the world. Iran's civil society and its young people in particular are among the most progressive in all the Middle East and have always advocated for their rights and interests. They demand change. Dear, dear friends, Iranians expect a lot from us, it's certain. They expect us Europeans to stand up for our core values, the defense of human rights and democracy, no matter the geographical location in the world. So I, I ask all the, all the Europeans, and especially the Euro European Union, not to let them down. Thank you very much. <laughs>